Hey, good morning. So, we were talking about improper integrals, and I believe we introduced the last uh, sort of improper integrals, but didn't have the chance to do any examples with it. And that was looking at integrals from some number, yeah, sorry, from some number to infinity of f of x dx. Um, also, <laughs> geez, uh, sorry. Also integrals from negative infinity to b, also integrals from negative infinity to positive infinity, but no, I'm I'm wrong. We had ch a chance to do a single example, I think. But we defined this as a limit, just like we defined other improper integrals to be limits. And yesterday we saw an example where that, not yesterday, you know what I mean, where that improper integral exists. We looked at, I don't remember the exact details, but something like that with an exponential. And we found that this integral exists, that this limit exists, and this integral converges. So, I mean, it should be pretty clear. It's very easy to um, find examples where that integral doesn't exist. I mean, the vast majority of functions You look at x squared from one to infinity, the area under the curve is just this huge region that gets bigger and bigger as we go from left to right. Of course, that doesn't exist. So a more interesting example, so I mean, graphically, what has to happen for this limit to exist is that this function has to be going to zero. The region never ends, but it has to get so thin that even though there's an infinite region, it has a finite area. So we looked at e to the negative x, that's exactly what, what e to the negative x looks like, something like that. So instead of doing something like x squared, which is just kind of silly, let's look at 1 over x. Because 1 over x has the shape that makes us think maybe this integral exists. 1 over x is going down to the x-axis. So this region under the curve is getting very, very thin. It seems at least plausible in light of what we saw last week that this integral might exist. Well, having said that, I've kind of already given the game away. I think I started this example by saying we do one where the integral doesn't exist. 
So the integral from one to n of one over x dx Trying to keep our life nice and easy here. Not looking at functions where we have to use super complicated integration techniques. One over X is an integral we can hopefully take. And the limit as N goes to infinity, the natural log of n minus the natural log of 1. The natural log of 1 is just a 0. And I mean, if you don't remember that, you can plug it into your calculator. So no problem there. The only issue with this kind of improper integral is that you end up taking limits as n goes to infinity. And that's not, I mean, that can be hard compared to the previous week where we just use integrate, I mean, we just use continuity and we just stick the number into the limit. I mean, we can't just stick infinity in here, the natural log of infinity isn't a real thing. You can't plug it into your calculator. So we need to either have, I mean, we can use graphing if it comes to that, but hopefully we have some intuition about this function. Like the natural log of x is a function we should all have studied at some point. I mean, if it was in high school, maybe at some point a while ago by now. The natural log of x looks something like that. And it grows extremely slowly. Um, but it does grow without bound. It doesn't have a horizontal asymptote. As we go further and further to the right, the natural log goes to infinity. Let's take a quick look. Natural log of X. So I said it was growing extremely slowly by 800 are still sitting under 10. However, if I let x be large enough, you see this thing is growing. It just keeps going up. In fact, uh, Desmos does not love this. That's an interesting graphical artifact we're seeing. But there, I mean, if we want this to be bigger than 200, we can make it bigger than 200. If I hadn't got bored of adding in zeros, we could have made it bigger than 400. So at a very, very slow pace. But as we go to infinity, the natural log goes to infinity. And this integral does not exist.
Um, we'll talk about this more in a later chapter, in chapter 10. Um, but I'll just make an observation here. We have one over x to the first, and one is a cutoff point that tells you whether or not this integ an integral that looks like this converges or diverges. If we look at one over x squared dx, or since I've said one is a cutoff point, let's say if we look at the integral of one over x, to one point to zero one, from one to infinity. Now, I was going to just going to be sloppy after I've, I've repeatedly told you we don't want to be sloppy. So what's this integral? Um, X to the Positive 0 0.1 over 0 0.1, right? Yeah, see. 0 0.1. I mean, I mean 0 0.01. Right. Well, um, that's close. But I want to say, so we're starting at negative 1.01. We add one to this, we'll still be in the negative. Okay. So we'll still be at negative um, a point to zero one. And then we've got the division, just like you say. So this, I always find it, I always find it easier to think what's going on if we rewrite our negative exponents once we've taken the integral. So negative one point, negative point zero one times one over x to the point zero one. And we're evaluating from one to n. Informally, we're evaluating from one to infinity. Yeah. But we are being, being very nice and very neat and writing everything on the board. So negative one over negative point zero one times one over n to the point zero one minus negative. Wait, what happened? Nothing really happened, just somehow I made a little typo. I say somehow as if it's uh once in a lifetime experience, because I have this negative sign in front of the point zero one, I don't also have a negative sign there. So 
So fuss, our negatives canceled out. And here, this is finite. So one did not converge, but this does converge. In particular, I'm not claiming this should just be immediately obvious, but this equals one. One to any power is one. So this is a hundred, one over one, one hundredth. This is negative 100, and this, as n goes to infinity, goes to zero. And again, it would be good to have some pre-existing intuition about this function, um, but here it is. It goes to zero very slowly. If you just look at this graph, you might think there's a horizontal asymptote. But you see as X gets bigger and bigger, this is crawling ever downwards and getting closer and closer to the x-axis. So this limit is zero. Then any number times zero is zero. So zero plus a hundred equals a hundred. It's a finite number. On the other hand, going from one to infinity, Let's go one over X to the zero point nine nine. I said that one was a cutoff. We looked at a power that was just a little bigger than one. Let's look at a power that's just a little less than one. And because I do have other things I want to talk about today, I'll go through this a little quickly. Particular, let's, we're taking a limit, and now let's take the integral in the same step. Here's our point zero one, because we start at negative 0.99, we add one to that, we get a little above zero. We divide by 0 0.01. We're going from one to n here. So we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity. There are no negative powers.
One to any power is one. A hundred times one is a hundred. But if we now look at what that, the term with the N is doing, default our zoom, so we no longer have a negative power, just a point zero one, and this is kind of the opposite of what we just saw. Um, it goes up so suddenly it looks like it's just vertical, and now it looks like it's hit a horizontal asymptote, but like with the natural log. If we just start adding zeros to this thing, it's going to go up and up and go to positive infinity. So infinity minus a finite number is still infinity, and this function, this integral diverges. The area under the curve is infinite. And I mean, if you compare, it, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I think it's kind of interesting because if you compare these curve functions, one over x raised to the point 99 power and one over x raised to the 1.01 power. I mean, these curves look awfully similar. In fact, they look indistinguishable from each other. I mean, if we didn't have that sort of cheat um, showing us which this curve is, there is no way to tell. Nevertheless, although these curves are visually indistinguishable, um, the area under one of them is finite and the area under the other is infinite. So it's a very delicate, um, it can be very delicate whether an integral converges or diverges. So questions on that. In applications involving um, improper integrals, I'd say that the significant majority of them are improper integrals like the ones we've just looked at. And that's because we'll, we'll do an application or two tomorrow, but um, in the vast majority of applications that I can think of, our variable is time. And asking what happens as time passes, what happens in the future. That's a very intuitive thing to want to ask. What's this animal population doing in the future? What's a disease doing in the future? What's a drug concentration doing in the future? By contrast, it's pretty hard to imagine where an integral that looks like this would show up in real life. For an integral like this to show up in real life, you're imagining something that doesn't start anywhere. A process has always been going on from negative infinity up until now. And that's, I mean, I guess if something's been going on for millennia and you don't want to pick a specific start date, 
you could say though it's been happening forever. But in reality, applications that look like this are kind of uh, few on the ground in my experience. And again, I have to sort of emphasize, you know, I make these grand statements about applications, but no one can see all of the applications. I mean, I've never taken an engineering course, for example. So I'm just sort of, my background's in math biology. I'm just giving my background from that point of view. But um, there's nothing super tricky or difficult about this, or I guess I should say that this is exactly as tricky and or difficult as this case is, and you can decide for yourself how you feel about all of this. Instead of Instead of going to infinity, we let n go to negative infinity. And other than that, there's not a lot to say. Let's do an example. And again, um, I, I keep using zero and one, I feel like, just for variety. Let's go from negative infinity to seven. Um, what I was starting to say before I interrupted myself is that for the vast majority of functions, this integral isn't going to exist. I mean, again, if we look at x squared. This region just becomes bigger and bigger as we go to negative infinity. Of course, the area under this curve is not finite. E to the negative x if you look at its graph, at least seems like it might be finite. E to the negative x. Wait, did I say E to the negative x? Did I write that down? Bah. Want a negative sign there? Just want the E to the x. Now let's fix that here, there. So this at least looks, I mean, as we go in the negative direction, this is hugging this asymptote, it is hugging the x-axis. So it does look credible that the area under this curve might be finite. And as for the positive part, well, nothing really interesting is happening here. I mean, this is growing very quickly, very quick. I always forget. I mean, I know it intellectually, but I always forget just how quick exponential growth is. Let's go here and let's uh, there. So here's the curve. We're looking at the area 
under this curve, some shaded region here, and then this infinitely long, but maybe not infinite in area region. All right, so I picked about the most straightforward example possible in the sense that e to the x is about the most straightforward integral you can take. The integral of e to the x is e to the x. We're going from negative infinity to seven. So I guess I'll write this down, be all formal and correct. The limit as n goes to negative infinity of e to the seventh minus e. Sorry, I'm talking a good game about being formal and correct, but it's one of those days for typos or whatever the written equivalent of a typo is. So this is e to the seven is just whatever it is. It's some large number. We have already been on Desmos and we've already seen that as n goes to the left, as we go to negative infinity, this thing is hugging the x-axis. That limit is zero. And this ends up being e to the seventh, which... The area is just the same as the function. Uh, oh, no, no, I see. I, I understand, sorry. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a very special case with this E function because um, to find the area we integrate and with E when we integrate, we wind up with the function we started with. Let's see. Can we do something? I'm just thinking we should try to do something a little more adventurous. Um, let's look at the arctangent of x plus pi over 2. I think I'm going to be able to integrate this. And let's look at what happens. I mean, let's look. at this region, and let's try to figure out whether this is finite or infinite. And really, this problem amounts to, can we figure out how to take this integral? And I think that we can. I believe that this integral is going to be um, susceptible to the same trick we used with the natural logarithm.
ignoring the pi over two for a second. The trick we used with the natural logarithm was to say, well, anything can be a product if we really want it to. In particular, if we're trying to use integration by parts, we need a product. And this is a product. It's one times the arc tangent. Now, 99 times out of 100, or maybe more like 999 times out of 1,000, this trick isn't going to get you anywhere. What made the natural, what made it work with the natural logarithm is that taking the derivative really simplifies the natural logarithm. And the reason it might work here is that taking the derivative really simplifies the arc. Tangent. The arc tangent is super complicated. It's derivative. What is the derivative of the arc tangent? Does anybody remember? It's one over one plus x squared. So the arc tangent is super complicated. It's derivative is a little nicer. So try, I mean, the reason this trick doesn't usually work is that V is going to be more complicated than D V. The whole book point of integration by parts is that um, things become simpler. When we go from D V to V, we want something. We don't, if we at least don't want things to be more complicated. We are making things more complicated here. X is more complicated than one. But DU is much simpler than the arc tangent. So over here, are making things a little more complicated, but we're compensating over here. By making things much simpler. And When I talk about making things more complicated or making things simpler, this is what's going to show up inside the integral. What's the integral of V du? So we've replaced this one with something a little more complicated. The one is being replaced with an X. But we're replacing this arc tangent with something nicer. And let me see. U V This is the, the reason I ordinarily pick simple examples. Um, so there's the integral. And because we are in very real danger of running out of time before I finish this problem, 
I won't make you work um, and ask you to take this integral. It's a u substitution, u is one plus x squared. Du is two x dx. The old trick. This, I mean, by the way, this is this is how I learned to do it. I'm certainly aware that some of you seem to prefer to do it a little differently by solving for whatever. I'll just do it how I do it, and if you want to. Um, do it a little differently, that's fine. X arc tangent of X minus one half the integral of one over U du heavens. This is not a very nice integral at all. X times the arc tangent of X minus one half the natural log of the absolute value of one plus X squared. So that's does this look right to everyone? I know parts wasn't, uh, well, hasn't, I know parts was a while ago, but D of E and U, U D of E, we let U be the arctan, D V B one, that's all fine. Um, the antiderivative of one is X, the derivative of the arctan is one plus x squared. That's all fine. The parts formed of the asks for u times v. X times the arctangent of x minus the integral of v du. Put in the two, put in the one half. That's all fine. We wind up with one over u. Okay, after double checking, I'm still pretty confident in this. So we get this terrible integral. I have not, uh, I have not forgotten that i over two. It would be a shame to the trip on the finish line. Although, also, I don't know if we're really on the finish line. What am I doing today? My hand's just writing whatever without any input from my brain. But when we have a sum, we can integrate a sum, we can just integrate it sum and by sum and. And pi over two is easy to integrate. The integral of pi over two is pi over two times x. So that's just. Eliminate that. The limit, as n goes to infinity, the integral of the arc tangent negative infinity, the integral of the arc tangent. which is this minus one half, the natural log of x squared plus one the integral of pi over two
And we are going from N to zero. And I have no idea if this limit exists or not. I'm just going to uh, rely on technology. We'll start by plugging zero in. And this as a number, it's, I am, I am not a magician doing all of this in my head. I just see we have zero times something there. So that's going to go away. And then I remember that the natural log of one is zero. So this product's going to go away and leave us just with that pi over two. Dr. Moses, in the yes. top there, should it be a pi over two times x? Because it's the infinite. Absolutely should be. Which in fact does something interesting, thank you for catching that, turns this whole thing into zero. So, minus what happens as we go to negative infinity, as I say, no idea, the wonders of technology will come to our rescue. We've got x times the arc tangent. of x minus one half the natural log of x squared plus one plus come on this folks just when I was talking up Technology, what don't you like about this? Okay, x times the arc tangent of x, it doesn't mind. Okay. Minus one half is minus zero point five is it not like the absolute value that is so weird though that's most okay i'll bet it has to be the natural log parenthesis put the absolute value in parentheses Okay, so x times the arc tangent of x minus 0.5, this natural logarithm, plus pi over 2x. Okay, so it looks to me, well, actually, I don't know how it looks to me. And we've seen that this can be deceptive. Let's go to the graph settings. And that's that X really go Okay, so it looks to me 
as if this limit does not exist. We We add more zeros. I think I broke it in some way. Oh, no. This mouse is now claiming that this limit is zero. Okay, I guess I sort of is talking technology up, but it's sort of failing us here. I can't quite tell what's happening. It looks to me as if this is going to negative infinity, but then when I made Okay, no, this is going right. At this point, Desmos, I mean, you can see this is a pretty complicated function, and Desmos is just like, I don't, I don't know, man, this is too much for me. But it looks to me as if this is going to negative infinity. And if it's going to negative infinity... Sorry for keeping you a few minutes late. Then this area does not exist. Pick up here tomorrow.